Today's message is Groundwork for Christ. And the theme scripture, if the button works, is uh, Matthew 1, uh, verse 21. This is when the angel announced to Joseph about uh, uh, Jesus. He said, an angel, uh, an angel told Joseph about Mary. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, meaning the Lord saves, because he will save his people from their sins. So what I'm hoping to accomplish in the message today is an, an increased appreciation for God as our Savior Redeemer, an increased appreciation for what happened leading up to and surrounding Jesus' crucifixion. We'll consider who God is, God's purpose, the mighty acts of God, God as Savior in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament as groundwork for Christ. Who God is, that's where we start. The Almighty Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator God. And that's who He is. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life. We've, we've talked about that recently, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time about it. God's purpose, we've talked about this quite a lot. But to love more life into being. That's what creation was about. To love more life into being. The communion of love, which God is, is called the womb of creation. The womb of creation. Uh, in Acts 17, the God who made the world and everything in it, it's he, gave, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else, that they should inhabit the whole earth. God wanted more people. He wanted a relationship, increased relationship. Love spread abroad. That was his purpose. He fashioned and made the earth and formed it to be inhabited. And we've talked about this quite a bit, so I'm not going to really talk about it much today. To bring all things together in unity in Christ. Okay, now, what scripture would you go to to uh, support point number two there? We've talked about it quite a bit. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, it's it's uh, it's um, uh, Ephesians one, verses nine and ten. So that's that's a good one to have in your head. Okay, and the mighty acts of God, the creation of the universe. We've already talked about that. The creation of mankind. We've talked about that. But before we go on, let's get some perspective on time. How many of you can name all four of your grandparents? I, I want to see hands up here. How, and keep them up. Those who can, can uh, name all four of their grandparents. You cannot name all four of your grandparents. Okay. I'm surprised. Okay, how many can you name all eight of your great-grandparents? No hands? So, then, how many can name any of your 16 great-great-grandparents? <laughs> you know, 25 years per generation, we're, we're talking 100 years, only 100 years. And uh, given that, um, Jesus, as Emmanuel, preceded us by 20 times that amount. And the flood by... 43 times that amount. About 4,300 years ago was the flood. And about circa 2314 was the uh, Noatian flood. And what was happening then? The earth was corrupt in God's sight. It was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people had corrupted their ways. The earth is filled with violence because of them, it says in Genesis 6, verses 11 to 13. So, what is the result of an earth that's full of corruption and violence? 
Chaos and hatred. Chaos, hatred. Anarchy. I'm sorry? Anarchy. Anarchy. I think, did, Marie, did you say something? No. I thought I heard another female voice. <laughs> the world today. The world today. It almost sounds like today, doesn't it? And, yeah, Bob. Everybody suffers. Everybody suffers. Yes. We even learn violence in our media and our video games today. It's sad, but we have this crazy appetite for violence. But the result of an earth full of corruption and violence is ultimately destruction. So God was actually saving mankind by the flood by choosing a faithful man and his family, Noah, to save. And then in 2150, about 2150 BC, we have the Tower of Babel. And what was happening there? The whole world had a single language, a common speech. Now, I don't know, if when we've traveled in Europe and crossed borders, you know, you get different languages in every country. Thankfully, many Europeans speak English. That's very helpful. Uh, but we, were on a, we got on the wrong train in Brussels. No, we, yeah, we were in Brussels. And we were supposed to go... Oh, we were, we were going from the airport. We were supposed to go to the, uh, to, from the train station in Brussels to the airport in Brussels. We got on a, a, the wrong train and ended up in Ghent, about 50 miles away. <laughs> and the, oh, th there was nobody who could speak English on our train car, <laughs> so we couldn't, we had a hard time getting that all squared away, but we, we got it. So uh, diff uh, different languages are really make it hard to, for things to happen. And when you consider how many languages that uh, there are since the Tower of Babel, it's quite amazing. Um, and the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And what were they trying to do? They were trying to build a tower to the sky, a city, and a tower to the sky. The uh, name Babel, or, um, yeah, in the Babylonian language means gate to God. They were trying to make a name for themselves, not for God, for themselves separate from God, apart from God. And you have to sort of read between the lines here, but the rejection of a loving God is not going to end well. So, it appears to be implied that God saved mankind through the confusion of languages as well. And then just to, to sort of keep things in perspective here, date-wise, uh, in about 1875, that's when God promised Abraham that uh, he would ultimately be the father of um, many, many people. And the promises to uh, Abraham that were eventually fulfilled in Jesus Christ were made. So then we have, in about 1710 BC, Israel going to Egypt through Joseph. You remember the story, you know, Joseph is 17 years old. Has, has anybody here seen uh, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? Yes, <laughs> a few of you. It, it's a rather humorous uh, play, and it's been done as a movie about Joseph. Well, um, I, uh, Israel loved uh, Joseph more than the other children, basically because he was the firstborn of his favorite wife. There were four ladies involved, which really created a lot of problems. <laughs> uh, and and uh, the brothers didn't like him too well, so they sold him into slavery, into Egypt. Uh, he just happens to be there when Pharaoh has a dream, and uh, Joseph is known to be able to interpret dreams through the gifts of God. And um, uh, he interprets Pharaoh's dream and he's made second in Israel, like the prime minister of Israel, and, or of Egypt rather. And uh, that, because of that position, he was able to save the whole family of Israel from out of Israel. And um, 
Joseph said this, don't be afraid, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So Joseph saved, or excuse me, God saved Israel through all of these events that God used. And he used Joseph to save, to save Israel in that way. And then at about 1445 BC, God delivers Israel out of Egypt. Um, we have the ten plagues. What was God doing with those ten plagues? Discrediting the gods that they worshipped. Discrediting the gods that the Egyptians worshipped. He was saying, I am God, I am powerful. He was making his glory known to the Egyptians, especially to Pharaoh. And he, he was saying, in effect, I have the power to save my people. And then we have the salvation. The, the tenth plague was the death of the firstborn sons. And those who put blood on their doorposts and lintel, uh, the firstborn were saved. That was the first Passover, and that salvation was because of the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. And then the deliverance through the Red Sea. It was a total victory for God delivering Israel out of Egypt. We have this is, is the, the, the beginning of the song of Moses and Miriam after, after uh, uh, they passed through the Red Sea. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse, both horse and rider, driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. God is a God who saves. He saved Old Testament Israel from Egypt. So the Old Testament is... It, a groundwork for Christ. God repeatedly saves mankind in the Old Testament, illustrating he is a God who saves. The saving out of Israel, of Israel out of Egypt through the Passover is a precursor to Christ with the themes of redemption from slavery, salvation from sin, pictured as their being taken out of Egypt, salvation by the at the sacrificial blood of a lamb, and that Passover energized the Jews of Christ's time to hope for another act of God's salvation. So all of what happened in the Old Testament up to the time of Christ, up to the time of his crucifixion, is there as background and groundwork for uh, Jesus Christ. So we've considered who God is, his purpose, the mighty acts of God, God as Savior in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament as groundwork for Christ. Consistent with who God is and his purpose for mankind, God laid the groundwork for Christ by being Savior in Old Testament acts, especially Israel's Passover deliverance out of Egypt, and Passover raised hope and expectations for God to again save the Jews. Bottom line, the Old Testament laid the groundwork for Christ. That was its purpose. Thank you, Lord, for being the God who saves. The God who has always saved. The God who saved through Jesus Christ. Is saving through Jesus Christ and will save through Jesus Christ. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.